Okay, very good morning to you. It's Thursday the 15th of April. Hope everything is going well. And gonna do the usual kind of routine. I'm gonna get you up to speed what happened. Uh, just kind of a summary from yesterday. The close on Wall Street overnight in Asia Pack. And then a quick review of the headlines and then the view for the day ahead. I'll leave the kind of technical view of the charts to the guys in Amplify Live in the community to go over. So I'm going to predominantly focus on the, the news aspects of this morning. But just having a quick check across asset classes to look at the overall sentiment this morning at the European Open. And relatively calm, uh, not too much movement seeing in the major FX pairs and euro dollar cable, which are broadly flat at the moment. Um, elsewhere, T notes are unchanged and US equity index futures very marginally higher after the generally lower close that we had yesterday. So as a consequence, the DAX is, is basically flat. Uh, interesting uh, level short term for the DAX of potential resistance, that previous era of support this week turned now resistance during the Asia Pac trading hours. You got the pivot sat just above, worth just keeping an eye on there in the DAX. but. The close on Wall Street, uh, actually we finished down 0.4% in the S&P. Uh, the Dow was a slight outperformer up just shy of two tenths. The Nasdaq underperformed and was down 1.31%. Uh, I believe Coinbase as well after that initial pop on the open actually declined uh, as well fairly substantially. That comes as well with Bitcoin just coming off a little bit from those initial highs. Bitcoin futures have traded in excess of 65,000 in the last 24 hours trading back down around 63 and a half at the moment, but I don't really see too much really of but uh, of negativity behind that. I think it was just a little bit of buy the rumor, sell the fact going ahead of the bullish nature of, uh, in front of Coinbase. And just looking at the Bitcoin future here, uh, quite an area of potential support to be eyed at around the 62,000 level, uh, that being the peak that we had back on the 14th of March. Uh, the test on the 12th of April before the breakthrough that came through earlier this week on the 13th. That's acted as support in yesterday afternoon's trade. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the other chart, just briefly to mention, was oil. Um, it, it really did continue the, the breakout trend from yesterday. Uh, and yesterday, of course, we did have the oil inventory numbers uh, and we saw domestic infantries fall for the third week to the lowest since February, uh, a, a much more deeper draw than what was seen in the prior days, API oil infantries. You've generally got this perception uh, of economic growth going forward, OPEC still in play, supporting prices as well. So uh, that with some technical breaches on some key levels really saw um, the, the oil move open up yesterday uh, and we jumped almost 5%. It's the biggest move we've had since late March. Um, in regards to, to WCI crude and it, it holds that move this morning. We're trading flat at 63.16 and there is some news I can update you on in regards to Saudi Arabia in Iran uh, as well, which could also be something to keep an eye on uh, with the threat of potential for more bullish price action there. Uh, but look, let's get into it and talk a little bit further about oil then and going to transition to... Well, actually, before I do, let's have a quick wrap about uh, Asia. So the US close, as I said, was mixed on a performance generally, though, in the NASDAQ. And actually, if you look at the percentage changes, interestingly, it's pretty much <coughs> it's pretty much the exact mirror image of the prior day's price activity that we had on Tuesday. So where the NASDAQ was up about one and a quarter, it was down 1.3 yesterday, where the Dow was down a third the prior day it was closed up about two tenths so all in all actually when you x out some of the uh, initial equity appreciation that we had on the back of the um, more controlled inflation us cpi increase that we saw and then to yesterday when markets rolled over a little bit net net we're actually pretty flat so take yourself out of the intraday kind of noise for the moment and in actuality we've really gone nowhere so far so we're still consolidating to a certain degree up and around these uh, record high levels we of course as well did have those big banks reporting the first three big ones and uh, reported much higher than expected profits um, fueled by just breakneck growth in investment banking fees buoyant capital markets lower credit cross costs due to the improving economy uh, but the traditional banking business of taking deposits and making loans 
continued to grow less profitably and, and, and executives did actually warn that the boost to earnings from those activities would likely fade going forward and JP Morgan was an underperformer of that. Um, the more kind of clean investment banking kind of makeup of Goldman's did see them slightly outperform but later on today don't forget you've got Bank of America and City coming out. The latter of course much more exposed on that loan commercial banking side so be interested to see how they perform as well later. Um, in terms of Asia um, generally a, a slightly negative tone but albeit very moderate um, China was a slight underperformer there's a couple of things going on in China at the moment in fact um, tensions between US and China lingering amid the US delegation visit to Taiwan and China's military to conduct live fire drills off Taiwan so that's kind of one thing at the moment um, it sounds pretty sensational it's not unusual kind of flexing the military muscle ahead of a, a top tier meeting with US officials but that's one thing secondly China's top officials in Hong Kong have warned that the foreign powers which attempt to use Hong Kong as a pawn will face countermeasures so continue friction there about the kind of uh, the situation of the increasing control that the state's trying to have on, on Hong Kong but also Taiwan and those two issues do link together in this uh, forming this one China policy view coming out of Beijing uh, as they continue to pursue that um, kind of objective and then the third thing is overnight Chinese central bank liquidity operations generally saw what what is being deemed as, as a redrawal of liquidity uh, in a short term basis in medium term lending facilities and so those combination of things just leading to a little bit of a weaker tone for, for China specifically but I don't really think there's much read across into how European US markets are going to react on the back of that more of a domestic move I'd say uh, we did have some Aussie employment data overnight and actually it came in at 70.7 thousand which was basically double expectations but if you're looking at the Aussie chart this morning you're probably thinking well why on earth is the Aussie fallen um, at the point of when the data came out so you had a momentary blip higher and we basically sold off and you know as with any piece of economic data it's always prudent to um, you know, kind of be aware of the details of why that number you know one golden rule I used to always tell the analysts that I used to manage in my previous job was that if you ever see a significant de standard deviation away and it's like a piece of data comes out triple quadruple consensus first thing I always used to ask myself was I wouldn't just take it as gospel that that number is just very strong I'd be questioning it going why is it very strong there must be a reason whether it's a methodology change whether it's a one-time uh, factor that's lifted it and in this case actually when you get under the bonnet of that very strong employment data in Australia um, it was solely fueled by part-time workers so in a sense they're not seen as such a positive in terms of any consistency in what the workforce will look like going forward so it's almost like a, a misfire if you like <coughs> and <coughs> easy to get caught the wrong side of that trade overnight um, but going back to some of the news then let's talk about oil talked about the price breakout yesterday technicals at play obviously spec speculative momentum traders at play intraday um, you've had the oil inventory numbers overnight as well the other thing that's kind of just simmering in the background is ongoing tensions at the moment between um, the, the, the kind of ongoing friction of uh, Saudi and Iran now why could there be ongoing friction between Saudi and Iran well guess what the US is still trying to find its feet about how it's going to deal with Iran and instead of a, an outright confrontation um, of conflict between Saudi and Iran it gets played out via Yemen in the south and the Houthi militants based in the west of that country and they start to play out this proxy war by trying to disrupt potentially the Saudi Aramco infrastructure in Saudi Arabia and that's exactly what's happening at the moment so on two fronts one on the top level the US and Iran will reconvene indirect talks aimed at reviving their 2015 nuclear deal that's said to be taking place on Thursday so today in Vienna um, according to the White House so obviously maximum negotiating stance you want to put on as much pressure as possible 
so that the other party feels like they're going to come and, and cut you a deal. So you can see that the timing around the increase of frequency of Houthi militant action on Saudi comes at a point in time when US and Iranian officials are actually meeting. These things do not happen by coincidence. The other thing here is that the UN nuclear watchdog has stated Iran has nearly finished preparations to begin enriching uranium to up to a 60% purity at one of its plants as well. Again, all of this happening at the same time. Now, what's been happening here um, overnight is that Saudi Arabia's oil facilities were targeted with drones and missiles for the second time in a week. Uh, Yemen, Yemen's Houthi rebels claiming the attack on the southwestern refinery town of Jazem and Houthis claim similar attacks on Sunday night in the eastern oil terminal of Jabal and the western city of Jeddah. And just to give you an idea of the lay of the land in Saudi Arabia, because this is an important map, I think, if you're, if you're a crude oil trader, and if you are going to really understand what a supply shock might look like to be reactive if there were a piece of breaking news. And here then, the, the two areas that have been targeted here, both on Sunday and last night, is Jeddah here and Jessan here on the Red Sea. And you can see how close it is to the actual border here with, with, with Yemen. So it's a bit of a reference and context. Jeddah is the second most populous city um, in Saudi Arabia after the, the capital Riyadh, I think population wise, circa 4.8 kind of million size. And Jessan has uh, some significant refining uh, capacity when it comes to uh, Aramco and obviously is situated in kind of the hotbed of the activity of a lot of the uh, the militant friction that's been happening at the moment. So oil prices at the moment, uh, I, I mean, they're not spiking on the back of what's happened um, last night. However, it's probably an underlying reason what might help support keep these prices uh, kind of elevated after yesterday's move, because quite typical that after you see an exaggerated progressive move in an asset price that breaks out and and again, deviates away quite substantially from its average day kind of price fluctuation. It's not that surprising to see some profit taking, but we're not seeing that this morning and the price of oil actually is holding quite nicely above 63 for the time being. Um, so yeah, hopefully that all makes a bit of sense. And as I said, later on today, the US and Iran will be talking about that nuclear agreement. Otherwise, the other thing to, to mention was Jerome Powell spoke yesterday um, what did he have to say? Well, he said the Fed will likely taper off its bond purchases before considering raising interest rates. Um, they haven't voted on the order, but that is the sense of guidance is what he said. So as a bit of a reference point, um, the kind of policy sequencing that he's referring to is of absolutely no surprise at all. Historical precedents and general markets understanding of, of, of monetary policy is that there's, there's certain levers that get pulled in a certain order. So in this sense then, the QE needs to decelerate, tapering needs to occur. You probably then need a period of then flatlining with no QE actively happening before then rates eventually rise. And so he's just kind of reaffirming that, uh, that point. Um, separately, you did have the latest beige book last night, which is that kind of 12 regional district report on isolation of, of smaller localized areas. Uh, and the general takeaway there is that on a national level, um, activity is accelerated to a moderate pace from late February to early April, and consumer spending is improving. Uh, but again, probably fits in lockstep with the vaccination improvements and the general reopening of, of different states. The other thing then is a quick update on J&J. &J. Uh, there still warrants monitoring at this point in time. The US CDC advisory panel decided not to vote on recommendations regarding the pause on J&J's vaccines stated that they needed more data. Um, so as per these headlines and what they're suggesting here, the pause that has been seen as lasting days may actually persist for weeks. And obviously, the longer that takes, the more broad the implications would be, not just for the US, but any other country that is awaiting supply of that particular vaccine. So definitely one to, to keep an eye on. As far as the calendar is concerned for today, it's pretty quiet in the UK European morning. Um, these latest CPI numbers coming out of uh, Germany and France are final figures, so not looking for any market reaction. So then really the focal point from a schedule is going to be the US retail sales report and the continued uh, or initial jobless claims, both coming out at 1.30 London time. 
Focusing on the retail sales report, obviously February was a particularly bad number, minus 3%. Um, whereas we're expecting an aggressive rebound up to 5.9 and the range is wide. The most optimistic is looking for a 12% print um, today in the month to month US retail sales number. <coughs> a couple of important things to be aware of here. For one, um, January numbers in retail sales were, were quite pumped, if you remember, chiefly buoyed by the stimulus checks that hit late in the end of 2020. So the fading of that kind of hit in February in combination with very bad weather, uh, the kind of great freeze that took hold in North America. So going into March, we've kind of got three things, the vaccination improvements, the reopening, which is helping, the improvement in the weather conditions, um, kind of, kind of uh, normalizing after the cold snap that we saw in the prior month. And then we've got the $1,400 stimulus checks also hitting in that period as well for certain income threshold um, individuals and families as well. So that number has a potential high side um, potential shock. I don't think that in itself, though, is particularly meaningful for the Fed. So there's, there's two ways to look at this. It could act as a catalyst if we're sat at, in a particular product at a certain key technical level. It could act as like the kind of match that just gets us through then to initiate that price through that level. However, will it really influence the Fed? I don't think so. Even if we get a 12% number, um, I'm not sure how much after the intraday that the Fed are gonna sit there. And can they realistically say that 12% is sustainable? It's probably not because of the aforementioned reasons. So the Fed would want to see underlying consistency in that data, Xing out a lot of these anomalies. So uh, from a policy perspective, I don't think it's it's going to be too influential. From a market moving point of view today, it could be quite key. Um, and, and for short term sentiment into the US session. Comes alongside jobless claims expected to drop to 700 from 744 uh, previous. Um, other than that, we get the US industrial production capitalization at 215. Um, and then a couple of Fed speakers, Bostic and Daly, probably the main ones, both voting members, the latter at 7 p.m. Uh, Mary Daly is speaking on financial stability and monetary policy. However, both of these two individuals have spoken multiple times in recent days and weeks, and so not expecting anything really new from them, to be quite honest. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Bank of America City coming up pre-market, other notable names, United Health, PepsiCo uh, as well. But that is it. Going to leave you to it and wish you a good day ahead. Uh, and I'll catch you in the Discord room on Amplify Live. Have a good day, guys.